Good day, everybody. Thank you for joining Nelba's Summer Symposium. We have a special guest today, Admiral Sandy Stowe. She is uh, retired, but the Vice Admiral of the United States Coast Guard. And does she have a great bio? She started out as an ensign serving on polar icebreakers, conducting national security missions from the Arctic to the Antarctic. 40 year career filled with various leadership lessons, um, breaking ice, breaking glass as the first woman to command an icebreaker on the Great Lakes and lead a US Armed Forces Services Academy. Along the way, she served 12 years at sea. She commanded two ships. She led, a large, uh, led large Coast Guard organizations during times of crisis and complexity. She finished her career as the first woman assigned as the Deputy Commandant for Mission Support, directing one of the Coast Guard's largest enterprises. She's lectured widely on leadership. She's been featured on C-SPAN, other media outlets, in 2012, by Newsweek's The Daily Beast, they named Sandy to their list of 150 women who shaped the world. And more recently, <laughs> she just released her first book, Breaking Ice and Breaking Glass, Leading in Uncharted Waters. Uh, for those of you who know me, I have a connection to General James Mattis, and his words on this book is that it is a prime resource for any leader's library. Admiral Stowe, you are not retired. <laughs> You are not retired at all. You're staying quite busy. So let me uh, take the first question. We have a great audience full of leaders, 40-year um, career. How do you get through the hard times uh, uh, in that 40-year career, especially in a leadership role? Well, first, Dan, I want to thank you for having me on. I'm so honored to be here speaking with this uh, astute audience at NALBA. And uh, boy, I tell you what, I know I depend on the insurance industry for my well-being and retirement and uh, my daily life. So thank you all for what you do. You've got a great mission and purpose. And I suspect the interview will get around to some questions that focus in that area. I will say, I wish I were here in person and I do look forward to being with you in November in person. It's tough when you're remote and I'm sitting in my living room right now. I'm not even on the deck of a ship. Uh, so I can't get the feel of uh, the audience or the, the circumstances. So I'll do my best. But Dan, thanks for um, asking a question that can launch me right into a story to start with. So how did I get through hard times? Well, certainly in 40 years, <laughs> there's hard times. I mean, if you were in a job for one year, you're going to have hard times. <laughs> Uncharted waters, like uh, the title of my book says. So I'll start with the story of the Coast Guard Cutter Katmai Bay a small icebreaker up on Lake Superior. And I had started my career in the Coast Guard, coming out of the Coast Guard Academy, serving on polar icebreakers that travel from the Arctic to the Antarctic. And as I progressed, I moved from those ships to a shore job eventually, working for the Coast Guard Service Secretary. It was the Secretary of Transportation, Sam Skinner. And I was privileged to be his military aide for a year and a half. And upon completion of that job, which gave me a great look at how the government worked from the top level, I went back to sea because I was a seagoing officer for my career specialty and was assigned to the cat in my bay up in Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. And that's an outpost way up on the border with Canada. And uh, they had never had any women command a, a ship on the Great Lakes, I think even including the merchant fleet. So I was the first uh, woman to command a ship uh, up there on the Great Lakes and reported up to have my change of command ceremony, which Secretary Skinner attended, which was very unusual. Normally the service secretary only attends, which is cabinet, le cabinet level, only attends uh, the retirement or change of command ceremonies for the most senior admirals in the Coast Guard, maybe the commandant of the Coast Guard, which would be the service chief. <laughs> he comes to my a lieutenant, a mere lieutenant, uh, about 28 years old, my change of command in Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. And I had a boss who I was going to be working for, who was a really old, gnarly guy, a captain, <laughs> way senior to me. And after the ceremony was over, where the secretary had given me praise, uh, he looked at me and said, you're just the secretary's fair haired golden girl. We'll see how long you last. Keep in mind, this was 1990. <laughs> Lots wow. has changed in the Coast Guard since then. But in a 40 year career, you're going to go back and you're going to have plenty of those hard times. But yeah, when I was young and still, you know, working towards my 
full competence and confidence, uh, here I have to start out um, under the spotlight with a boss who doesn't believe in me. So it was challenging. And there's a story behind this. And, and to make it short, one of my enlisted men, I had about 17 people on the ship. He was a chief petty officer and went up to that captain one day without me knowing it, closed the door and said, Captain, you've got to back off our our, cap, our commanding officer, our skipper for um, an informal term. She's doing a good job and it's really creating bad morale on the ship that the crew can see that you're pressuring her, pressuring her for no real reason. And you got to back off. And to the captain's credit, he listened to this enlisted man who he respected and backed off. And that guy was my ally. That was Dave Foley, chief bosun mate. And he served as an ally to a young woman who needed an ally. And, you know, my life got better after that. It was really hard. I had my resignation letter written. I had not looked at the bigger picture. I had become tunnel vision. I hadn't been thankful for what I had to be thankful for. I hadn't uh, looked beyond the present. Um, I hadn't focused on one day at a time. I was looking at the fact that I had yeah, two years to deal with this. So what I learned was so he retired after a few months. And what I learned was look at the bigger picture, um, focus on what you can be thankful for, start a gratitude log, uh, write down three things per day that you're thankful for, which I, I do to this day, focus on one day at a time, they were back at the academies, one push up at a time, one meal at a time, don't focus on the entire period you've got ahead of you. And remember this too will pass, <laughs> you know, somebody, something's gonna change in this in volatile world and the situation that you're struggling with won't last forever. So those are some um, secrets for <laughs> getting- right, that, that, Those are some really good points, Admiral. Now you mentioned the word change. Well, the whole world has had to deal, deal with change um, the past year, the insurance industry, especially. Um, you know, military training uh, is very applicable to the boardroom training, especially as it relates to change. So what should leaders do to ready themselves for the next, cha next change? I mean, we, we, we've seen SARS, we've seen other pandemics, not to the scale of COVID-19, but regardless, change is change. The market changes, the atmosphere changes, your staff changes. So a little insight on that, if you would, just how do you ready for the next challenge that comes along? Absolutely. And that's kind of one side effect of my book, Breaking Ice and Breaking Glass, Leading in Uncharted Waters. That was what defined me throughout my career, being one of the first women every time I reported somewhere. But everybody faces uncharted waters and you don't know what it's going to be. So for me, uncharted waters could have been a pandemic one day. And when I was commanding the Coast Guard's Recruit Training Center, our boot camp in Cape May, New Jersey, we had adenovirus breakouts, outbreaks every year or so where you had cases of young people coming down with that cold virus that you had to deal with. So it's going to be different um, every year. So the next thing that you all might have to face in the insurance industry might not be another version of a, a virus. It might be something completely different that you can't anticipate today. But what I do recommend is a, a bit of a formula um, for leaders as they strive to keep up with relentless changes, you know, impacting not just your business, but your employees, you've got to be able to anticipate changes coming over the horizon, which is not easy. You've got to adapt to new circumstances, adjust accordingly, and then be agile to meet emerging demands. And the anticipate part, you can put in place if you don't already have this or hire con environmental scans and make strategic planning a part of your executive leadership process. That helps give you vision over the horizon. Like in C, we'd say put the monoculars on and look over the horizon to identify emerging threats. And then what will my customers need in the next few years? Be looking at that in your case. What will be the challenges and opportunities in the next few years? All these things can be worked. Um, and you develop a mindset of anticipation that way, even if you can't tell exactly what's coming. And then after anticipate, adapt, be not just willing to be, but eager to face change and meet emerging needs. Gosh, trying to get people to think about adapting and changing is like, you got to whip them usually, <laughs> or, or put a carrot there, but how to create a culture where people are eager to change to meet emerging needs because maybe they can get rewarded for being the first one to notice to come up with an innovative solution. So put in place those 
incentives for people to want to adapt, to be eager to meet change, and then adjust, set expectations. This applies both to employees and the organization. So what expectations do you set for your people now in a changing world? Maybe they don't have the same comforts and conveniences they did, but maybe they trade that off for more fulfillment as they get more responsibility as the organization maybe flattens and pushes, pushes responsibility down. Whatever it does to adjust, make sure that people benefit from that so that they they adjust well. And then uh, fourth, be agile. So uh, anticipate, adapt, adjust, and finally be agile. Push the decision-making down to that lowest reasonable level. Help people to be nimble and create that culture where you, you don't you know, rag on them if they fail at something. They pushed and they tried to um, be agile and come up with a solution, it failed. Um, well, kind of help them back up after that failure, encourage them to go and try again because failure needs to be part of our culture. If you're not failing, it means you're not trying hard enough to find a new solution to meet the next change that might come. So to succeed, leaders have to establish a continuum of anticipating, adapting, adjusting, and acting with agility. I, I love those thoughts. I mean, we're, we're the insurance industry. Uh, when I first came into it, it was always talking about what is our next disruption and, and, and how are we mm -hmm. going to innovate, right? Buzzword, buzzword, buzzword. And then boom, the virus hits. The industry pivoted in a fantastic way. The concern now, though now is we adjust it. We don't, but we can't, and we adapt it, but we can't go back, right? You can't go back to what normal was because now there's a bigger awareness of, of, of a person's li a livelihood and their health. And, and there's, you know, life application, life insurance applications are up. So adapt, adjust. Um, I, I, my next question sort of goes into that. And selfishly, I, I shared with you offline, uh, I have a 14 year old daughter and I'm, I'm at that point of trying to give good advice, um, but it's also a bigger issue, right? It's a bigger issue that's what's going on throughout every company. And it, it's, it's around this specifically. You were oftentimes the only woman in the room, even at the executive level. How do you make yourself heard? How, you know, how, how do you make yourself be listened to? I mean, nobody wants to just have that checkbox and say, okay, we have a woman in this spot. But, but mm -hmm. I mean, deliver value, especially when you're breaking ice and, and, and breaking glass, uh, if I could use the title from your book. Absolutely. Well, before I answer that question, I will preface it with, yeah, I was the only woman in the room, even when I was a vice admiral, at, you know, having been 40 years with the Coast Guard at that point. Why? Because in, in the military, more so than uh, the private sector, you go along according to time and service if you're in the officer side. So you're only going to be at advanced people at a certain rate. So you can never get ahead or you can't really get behind either. You either don't stay in or you keep going at the same pace as everybody else. So I ended up being the only woman even because I could not run being the first. Organizations should look to create a critical mass of women if they can and minorities, a critical mm -hmm. mass of people. So there's, uh, so it's not the exception. Um, that to have a woman in the room, it's it's the rule, and that way you don't stand out, and it becomes more normal. <laughs> and it's hard to explain, but you know it when you feel it. When there's a critical mass, and one <laughs> in a room of thirty, which often happened to me, wasn't critical mass. So, here's what I would say: <laughs> I always try to have little formulas to make it easier for people to well to give my leadership lessons back, which is the whole purpose of my my book. So be prepared, be professional, and be purposeful. So how do you do that? So be prepared, do the advanced preparation and work. Ugh, there's no excuse. <laughs> if you want your voice to be heard, there's no excuse for walking into a meeting having not prepared and just expect that people are gonna turn Re to you. Regardless of who you are. <laughs> Why, yeah, right. regardless of who you are, the CEO right. or the most junior <laughs> person, you can't go in there and expect somebody to turn to you and say, Sandy, what do you think? Um, and, and then not be prepared. So you've got to do that prep. You've got to understand the subject matter. You've got to know the participants, not just the subject matter. Who are they? What's their expertise level? Um, what are their personalities? And you may or may not know this depending on the kind of meeting, but try to find out who you're meeting with so you can understand the playing field. And then discover where you can make an impact from that. So be thinking in advance, okay, here's what the meeting's about. 
I'm going to study my butt off. And here's the participants I'm dealing with. How can I, where can I find a niche to make a, um, an inroad to make an impact? Think about that in advance instead of the whole meeting going by and you're like, oh my gosh, I never raised my hand or jumped in. So be prepared. Second, be professional. So give others your attention when they're speaking. Listen, <laughs> and I will say for myself, listening is the hardest part. And you can say you're listening, but are you really listening to, do you care what they're saying? Or are you really thinking in your mind what you're going to say when you can jump in? And then when you do jump in, you haven't even been listening. So you say something stupid because you weren't really listening when somebody else was speaking. So give others your full attention. Be respectful. Don't interrupt. And make sure you've got the posture and presence that commands respect in turn. And that leads to confidence, your own confidence and other people's confidence in you. So this whole thing about being authentic and bringing your authentic self to work, <laughs> you got to be careful with that. I'm not saying I shouldn't have given it a thumbs down. I like to be <laughs> genuine better, but being authentic, that could mean you're in your t-shirt and you're you know, jeans with your knees cut out and you're just like chewing your gum. I mean, no, you have to put on the posture and the presence that is professional to, to the circumstances that you're in. And third, be purposeful. So get straight to the point. Um, sometimes I go and I navigate around. My husband tells me this and I'm probably doing it today. I apologize. <laughs> get straight to the point. <laughs> be clear and uh, be an ally. So how, how useful is it if you want to be heard to say, you know, Jack, the guy, if you're the woman, Jack just said, this he made a good point and then you take your point so be an ally to others in the room and guess what maybe instead of taking your idea and has any women in the audience i'm sure you've been here you say something kind of you think it's kind of profound it's a great idea the men kind of say nothing but the next man says the same exact thing and everybody agrees with it well Maybe if you could develop those, those allyships, then maybe that man would have said, hey, you know, Sandy just said, and I agree with her. So develop those allies. So um, be prepared, be professional, and be purposeful. Admiral, you mentioned about having um, a workforce that's just different kinds of people. And that's clearly where the world is going and not where we've been. Um, I say this completely tongue in cheek, but I've, I've noticed since coming into the insurance space, it's, it's very pale, very male, <laughs> and it's very stale. Um, and there's nothing, I mean, it, it's not that people didn't put in their time or their service, it's just how it is. But my point is sometimes, especially in leadership roles, change is hard. So change would be leading a diverse workforce. How do you, how do you, succeed and motivate in a, in, a, in a very different diverse workforce than maybe what you what you put all that time in to get to that position. Boy, that's a that's a loaded question and a very good question. <laughs> you know, I'm not sure in and of itself. Now, diversity by depth, by some manner of definition kind of has that DIV in there. Uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> it kind of means divide. So how do you unite and strengthen a diverse workforce to get the full benefit both for each individual and for the organization, instead of dividing and weakening, which we all see evidence of that, even in our nation now. So that's the question I would pose is, how do you unite and strengthen to make sure you're not dividing and weakening? And there's, I have another little set of things for that. <laughs> First, create a, a workplace a culture of respect. And you know where I learned this? My own Coast Guard. We have core values, honor, respect, devotion to duty. Those are our organizational core values. And I saw yours, you've got about seven or eight of them. And um, one of them is leadership. You've got some good ones in there, but every organization should have those to guide um, their way. So people who work in a respectful environment live by shared, the shared core values. Everyone has personal core values that they bring to the table. And I think it's important that if you're going to create that workplace culture of respect, there is that understanding of that un uniting of those personal core values and organizational core values. And if people can't meld those um, and make the organization's core values their own, it might mean there's a bad fit there. And that is sometimes where there's some division in a workplace. So that's something that supervisors can keep an eye out for. And respectful workplaces, I believe, are those where people employees 
I don't care if they're peers or subordinates and supervisors, seek the truth about both sides of an issue through respectful conversation. And each side has got to honor the other by seeking to understand and not undermine the other person. And I've seen this so often. It can be any kind of a workplace issue. It doesn't have to be politics. It can be anything about how you get to an um, answer on, on or a solution. But seeking to respectfully understand, not to undermine the other person. Uh, and that can go for a, a workplace of all this, the pale males, for that matter. <laughs> <laughs> I'm one of them, so I, I don't mind making fun of myself. Because diversity is not just skin color and gender and race. It is cognitive diversity of how people think. So sometimes the most under, misunderstanding comes between people who look similar, but have completely different ways of thinking about something. Maybe one's an introvert and one's an extrovert. Maybe one has got background that's uh, that's uh, um, artsy. One, maybe one's got an engineering mindset and there can be the conflict there. So I also think people should seek the implicit decency in those around them instead of presuming the implicit bias. So I'm not a big fan of this implicit bias um, presumption mm -hmm. that you look at somebody and based on what you see, their skin color or their race, you presume that they've gotta be biased. Why not presume that they're decent people? And then if they act inappropriately, then you hold them accountable instead of presuming there's something wrong with them or their way of thinking just because they were born a certain color or, or gender. I would say, okay. uh, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't want to interrupt you there. No, go ahead. You, you've said, right, the playing field's not always going to be level, right? There's, I, I imagine you probably came up with that when you're standing on some rough seas. Too. <laughs> but there's always going to be, you know, bigger, faster, stronger, smarter. Um, how do, and, you know, you know, education is being invested in, professional development is being invested in more and more and more and more. Sometimes you have a team that um, exceeds you in some of, as a leader, exceeds some of your skill sets. So how do you succeed uh, despite that, despite your own limitations when there is a unlevel playing field? Mm. You know, that's a, a really good question. And I thought I had a great answer for that. And I thought it was, hey, hard work and perseverance levels the playing field. And you know what? I still believe it does because sure. it did for me my entire career by working hard and persevering, that's the key. <laughs> so just working hard doesn't do anything if you quit and start again somewhere and never follow through, but persevering, that will level the playing field because there are people who aren't willing to persevere. There are people who aren't willing to work hard and they might be smarter <laughs> or, or faster, but they're not willing to put in the training or do what it takes. So, and, and I think that, so even though it's not the give all to end all, um, hard work and perseverance is certainly a broader picture. It's the starting point of leveling the playing field. And it's what you have control over because how much of that playing field do you not have control over? You don't have control over the humps and bumps. And those quite frankly, build character every time you trip. Yeah, you don't have um, control over the conflicts of the players, the, the fights on the field. Um, you got to resolve those. You've got to be respectful in resolving those. And you also need to realize it's not just you. The playing field of life supports a team, not just an individual. So you can level the playing field by relying on teammates who have the skills and abilities that complement yours. So first you do what you can, whatever that might be. And it starts with hard work and, per for, and perseverance. Second, you look to your teammates, once again, allyship, and you find complementing abilities and skills. And then third, Organizations, supervisors, executives, they can help level the playing field by providing opportunities for everyone, resolving disputes like the referee, making sure people that need the training because they can't kick as well, get out and get the kick, the kicking practice. You know, so I think there's the three levels there of personal, um, the team and the organization that can level that playing field of life. Let me, let me build off of that. I mean, this, this audience that, that is around Nalba, our, our member agencies, um, our trusted carrier partners, the, the key words that always come to their mindset in leadership is recruit and, and retain. And we're talking about building an atmosphere. We're talking about building a culture, a, a diverse workforce. I mean, so what are, you know, how do you really do that in a competitive industry? I mean, some of these carrier partners of, of Nalba are, are wonderful organizations. They're champions in the industry, but there's no doubt if there is a good salesperson out there, 
both will go after that person uh, to recruit. No, it's no different for a Nelba brokerage agency. If there is a very successful advisor out there, they will, they will recruit. Um, any thoughts on that? I, I do have thoughts on that, but I think it's very tough um, for anybody to give an answer that's going to be satisfactory. I would say that every organization, every member of NALBA should make sure that they are committed to being the best, providing the best training, the best leadership development opportunities, the best respectful workplace climates. And, and when you do that, you might train people and develop such good leaders that somebody else siphons them off because you're producing the best and your competition's watching to see who's got the best programs. They're going to come and get them. And that happens to the Coast Guard all the time. Oh my gosh, it was one day I was driving down the road heading to work when I was still in the Coast Guard a few years ago. And I heard a young woman speaking um, and she was speaking on an advertisement on the national radio for BP. I think it was British Petroleum. Uh -huh. She was talking about what a great organization it is, how environmentally friendly they are. She was a, a former Coast Guard Lieutenant in the Marine Environmental Protection field. She'd become a leader. We put her through all the leadership development. She'd gotten to the age of maybe 28 and BP harvested her and paid her much more than the Coast Guard was paying her. Uh -huh. But you know what? I think that if I talk to her right now, because I've talked to women like her, they're happy with the money they get at an organization that siphons them away, but do they have the same fulfillment and purpose? So money really can't buy happiness. It's an age old expression, really fulfilling our purpose uh, by, by growing ourselves is much more satisfying and deeply enduring than temporary happiness or what comes from some more money. So organizations that do the right thing and develop the leaders you know, develop the talent, eventually it's, I think it's gonna come back because um, people are gonna want to be fulfilled by a challenging mission where they can all be part of the same team pulling together. And it might, um, you might lose some people if you're the best at that, at building the workforce, but I think it'll come back around. So I think that to recruit and retain, be the best you can be and invest in your people, not just their leaders, their training and their skills, but build leaders. So you might not think in the insurance industry, it might not immediately come to mind that you need leaders, but you do. Anymore nowadays, you don't just need a good salesman or a financial advisor, you need a leader. And that is why that's the skills you need to have during the crisis times and the changes that come. Perfect way to, to segue to our, our, our last two questions that I'm, I'm, I'm gonna sort of combine here. We have a lot of C-suite executives, agency owners in, in our audience. We're talking about making decisions under pressure. We're talking about making decisions that are clearly different from the past and change is hard, but you know, what are some of the obstacles around decision-making at the executive level? And then the, my follow-up to that is gonna be like, you know, common character flaws that lead to executive <laughs> failure. And then I promise I won't take any more of your time. <laughs> I am so thrilled to be here. In, in fact, um, as you uh, in the audience can probably see, and Dan, you're probably thinking, oh my gosh, I can have a lecture for each one of these questions. <laughs> so this one that you talk about, how can executives make good, timely decisions? Because often, I mean, that's what you're paid to do when you're at the executive level is make decisions, the hard ones. Otherwise, they would have been made by subordinates. And what I saw in the military, uh, Coast Guard and military and other agencies was three um, things that got in the way of executives making those tough decisions that they had to make. And it demoralizes the workforce when the executive can't make a decision that they've prepared her or him for. So these three, the, I call them paralysis by analysis. You've got the leaders who will not make a decision because they can only get 80% of the information they need. And they want 100%. You're never going to get 100% on some of these decisions you've got to make. And you've got to do it. And there's a um, saying by General Patton that a good decision made today is better than a perfect decision making made next week. And of course, this is during battle. <laughs> you wait a week and you're going to be defeated. So paralysis by analysis, don't do it. Be comfortable. Develop the confidence to be comfortable enough to make a decision based on 80%. Um, of what you need or whatever it might be. And then second, the consensus conundrum. 
you can never please everyone. But nowadays there's become this, um, uh, this bad, I can't think of the right better word now, this um, bad belief that everyone has to agree. Oh, I want to be a um, empathetic manager. I want everyone to <laughs> like me. I want to be nice. So I need to get consensus. No, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> That's this great. You make are going to be ones where people are split down the middle because it's a hard decision. If everyone agreed, it would have made it the lower level. You're never going to please everyone. And I saw this really great bad morale when an executive punted a decision down the road, hoping it would just disappear and go away because he or she couldn't get 100% consensus. And third, the being nice syndrome. <laughs> and um, I've seen bosses, managers, executives who don't want to make a decision to hold somebody accountable, to change a policy, to require standards and adherence to them to pick one person for an award instead of picking the whole everybody because they don't want to single one person out and make somebody feel like they're not included. The being nice syndrome is really another one that can erode away at, at employee trust and confidence. Um, a boss, a good executive, a good decision maker should seek to be respected first to make fair and honest decisions that are for the benefit of the organization and the people. The being nice syndrome gets in the way of that because it takes people out of the logical mindset and gets them too close and too personal to one individual situation. So I would say paralysis by analysis, consensus conundrum, the being nice syndrome, avoid them, and you're on your way to making good decisions. <laughs> Admiral, um, I want to thank you, not, not just for today's interview, but 40 years of service to our country. Um, thank you for thank you for that. Uh, that that means a lot, and I know it means it resonates extremely well with with the Nelba audience. Um, breaking ice and breaking glass, leading in uncharted waters. Uh, I'm sure they could find a copy of the book. There it is on your website. Uh, it'll, there'll be a link onto the Nelba <laughs> website. We actually are going to have some of those books that we're going to give away. And Admiral Stowes is going to join us in November, on November 16th, at our annual meeting in Orlando, Florida. Thank you so much uh, for spending time. Uh, I mean, this is great for me. It's like I get my own leadership professional development as I host it. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. I was honored to be here. And I wish I had, uh, well, more <laughs> more time and a more, um, and I could see people. I'm really looking forward to seeing people in person in November. It's much yeah. more my style than the remote distance. Cause you can tell I'm a people person, albeit I'm shy and introverted. I'm a people person. That's why I'm <laughs> Dan right there. Thank you so much for inviting me and for giving me this chance to give back leadership lessons learned.